Thank you very much uh, for those kind comments and thank you everybody for remaining with me at the end of a very long day. If you'd all like to stand up and stretch, that's quite understandable. Um, two preliminary comments. Uh, first of all, I'm not exactly certain why I'm in this panel, uh, but nonetheless, I hope I have something that's interesting to say. Uh, and you'll understand why in a minute. Uh, the second thing is uh, one important uh, principle I would like to, you to keep in mind is something quite simple. Uh, our most important product is our students. And finally, I guess, unlike uh, my colleague from Kwantlen Polytechnic University yesterday, who began with the good news first and then moved to the bad news, I'm actually going to start with the bad news and move to the good news and hope that that leaves us all in a good place when we end today. I think we would all agree that innovation, which is the topic of this conference, is a much used word, especially in connection with higher education. But, I, but in this uh, connection, I have to wonder whether it is a word which is losing its utility. There are indeed as many definitions of innovation as there are days and months, days of the week or months of the year. So in thinking what I might say today, I did the expected thing. I googled the word innovation and was struck by what I found. Innovation is turning an idea into a solution that adds value. It's an application of ideas that are novel and useful. It's about staying relevant. And it's about something new or different that delivers value to the world. Now what struck me about all of these definitions is that they beg different questions about the words utility, value, and relevance. Or put another way, we introduce all kinds of new things around the edges of our universities in the name of innovation, but never, in my view, look at its most fundamental structure. And that's what I would like to briefly do this afternoon. There are ways to look at this, of course, and certainly we have heard a plethora of good ideas at this conference. And while I do not discount the need for all sorts of universities in this world, I come from an institution that places primacy of place on undergraduate education. And I would argue certainly that in this context, the word value, utility, and relevance have very particular meaning. And further, I would also suggest that our institutions, and I speak specifically in a North American context, are seriously falling short. Now many of you, I suspect all of you, have read Alan Bloom's book way back in 1987, The Closing of the American Mind, when he rather gloomily wrote that the modern university possesses no vision of what an educated human being is. And books along this line have been coming for the last 30 years telling us about all the things that we do wrong. Recently, however, there has been a new shrillness to the literature, as if somehow we are getting near the tipping point of how it is that we define our universities at the most fundamental level. And so one might argue if there ever was a time for innovation, it is now. Now among the plethora of books calling into question higher education in North America, one has in particular stood out for me. Canadians Ken Coates and Bill Morrison in their book with the rather tantalizing title of Dream Factories argue that young people have always dreamed of a future of success, fulfillment and happiness, the realization of the good life. In our world, however, they say things have changed. There is no clear roadmap, no certainty, limited rather than endless opportunities, too many graduates, too few jobs. But one thing has not changed. Young adults look to a university education as a necessary passport if their dreams are to come true. We have become, all of us, the object of global dreams and aspirations. But we need to ask the question, are we helping to fulfill the dream or are we simply perpetuating a convenient fiction? We keep an ever-expensive, ever-growing machinery busy 
selling our product. Now, we all know, I expect, what the problems and challenges are. That's by university, by the way. The towers are significant. Uh, we'll go a little further. My overheads are very simple. We all know what the challenges are. Cost. Universities cost a lot of money, and increasingly we have less of it. Univer governments have been less inclined to fund higher education in the face of competing priorities, and as we say in Canada, universities have gone from being publicly funded to publicly assisted. The second issue is how we do business. The two overwhelming realities of higher education in North America are increased tuition and greater debt. But there is a limit, and the consequence for universities inevitably is to try to do more with less, which means taking more students at reduced investment. Class sizes continue to increase, and now in Canada, and I would suggest in North America generally, 50%, if not more, of undergraduate students are now taught by non-permanent staff who we pay only a fraction of we pay continuing tenure-track faculty. The third issue is the primacy of research, a very controversial topic, because it is not just about not having enough money, it's also about how we spend it. And increasingly, universities are less and less about teaching and more and more about research. We often hear, and unfortunately there is considerable truth to it, that teaching is dismissed by many faculty as a necessary evil, and that research is the only thing that really counts. More than this, teaching, we have found, is now starting to indirectly fund research as tuition revenue is siphoned off into the research enterprise, leaving teaching starved. Teaching loads are reduced for high-performing research faculty, and again, institutions become more and more dependent on part-time sessional instructors. We also have to wonder about our shifting priorities. We used to consider teaching our core business, but this is now, I think, seriously in question. Universities in Canada are increasingly expected to provide a social safety net for our students. Inclusivity officers, mental health services, sexual assault centers, writing centers, psychological services, support for students with disabilities, offices for indigenous education, all of which are themselves valuable, but they also require money, and we don't get anything special for it. So in turn, they simply take resources away from our core mission, which is one of teaching. And along similar lines, everybody wants something out of us. We live in a world where accountability knows no end. There is almost a manic preoccupation with transparency and accountability. The language of presidents of universities today is not, is our academic enterprise doing well? The language is risk, legislative compliance, legal exposure, privacy legislation, emergency preparedness, and the list goes on. And we maintain separate offices for all of them, and they all require money. But beyond this, there are some even more fundamental questions that we need to ask. And I would argue, and perhaps it is the result of my 43 years in higher education, that there is an increasing skepticism about the value of higher education and about whether it is worth the investment. Some have gone so far as to call higher education today one of the great scams of our time. This introduces a whole series of other issues. The first, hang on, we're not doing what we say. There is an assumption that students will leave university better able to cope with the world than when they entered. And there's a whole raft of statistics that suggest that's not the case. In their book, Academically Adrift, Araman Rooksha note that 
of students do not demonstrate any significant improvement in learning during their first two years at university, while 36% of students do not demonstrate any significant improvement in learning over their entire four years of study. We keep students too, ling too long and perhaps give them too little. In North America, we advertise a four-year degree as if it was something special, when in fact the only reason it seems we offer four-year degrees is because everybody else does it. Most students do not graduate in four years. In Canada, it takes students anywhere between 4.3 and 4.5 years now to complete a four-year degree. There is a question, a tale of questionable success. Years to graduation are only part of the story. The other is the number of students who actually graduate. At present in Canadian universities, 60 per, only 60% of students actually graduate within six years. Students leave unfulfilled, and institutions in the meantime have invested enormous amounts of money in their education. Employers are unhappy. Many in Canada who argue that students are not getting the education they need, employers are routinely unhappy about the work ethic, basic skills, and expectations of university graduates, and we hear a lot, including from our last presenter, about the significant misalignment of higher education with the job market. A standard complaint we hear over and over again is that faculty teach the courses they want to teach rather than the ones that students need. And then finally, perhaps the most insidious of all, is that the statistics for university graduates are worrisome. While universities point to employment rates for graduates that are routinely high, and we have seen those numbers, 88% of our students are employed after two years, of af two years after graduation. What these numbers mask is that unemployment is one thing, underemployment is another. Canada's Parliament Budget Officer reports that four out of every 10 young workers with a university degree in Canada are overqualified for their job in the years after graduation. Now this is only the thin edge of the wedge concerning the challenges around higher education. And regardless of details, these concerns constitute one big concern about higher education and how it will unfold in the coming decades. And there are all kinds of answers to these questions and we have addressed and tried to address many of them at this conference. But I hope we would agree that we need to address, when we discuss issues of innovation, we need to address some of the fundamental structures of our universities to see whether we can do a better job. I'm going to talk about one solution. And in the last half of my presentation, I want to focus on a unique development in Canada, which is represented by a number of schools, which I believe constitutes a new way of doing things and a new way of defining what it means to be a comprehensive university in an attempt to address some of these significant issues. The two western provinces, Alberta and British Columbia, have a long tradition of regional colleges which are, offer an array of practical programming that includes diplomas, certificates, and trade certification. Over the last 10 years, a number of these institutions, my own included, have been recreated as universities with the specific intention of bridging the two kinds of institutions, the colleges on the one hand and the universities on the other, to create new forms of credentialing that are flexible and that focus on the changing needs of our students. Key in this transformation is the retaining of the teaching focus associated with the colleges, with a clear mandate that while research is there and to be valued, it must never ever be a priority for the institution and that there must always remain a clear connection between research and undergraduate teaching. Now, while everything has not been clear sailing, I think there are a number of things that can be taken away as lessons learned. 
and these I'll very quickly share with you. What? Uh, I think, sorry, I missed one here. We begin with a question about why the degree. You know, there's nothing sacrosanct about an undergraduate degree. And we need to accept that today, many of our students do not want to or cannot afford to spend 5.3 years in universities. But we have continued to argue that degrees are worth more than other kinds of credentials and to assert the primacy of place of universities among post-secondary institutions. There is absolutely no justification for this. And we must find a way for students to access all forms of higher education in a seamless fashion, which goes to this. In the case of my own university, when we moved from being a college to a university, and I think this would be the case for the other new universities in Western Canada, we did not jettison the college diploma. When we made the move to a university, and in fact, we consciously decided to do, that to do so would be irresponsible. At the same time, we recognized that the degree was the currency of a university, and that we needed to find a way of merging the two credentials together. And we began by ensuring that the academic standards for all credentials were the same, and that every diploma and certificate program bridged into a degree, and that every degree allowed an early exit with a diploma. And quite frankly, students like the idea of being able to take something very practical, high demand, in an area as straightforward as massage therapy, and then later laddering it into a degree in health administration without losing credit. Or completing a diploma in library and information technology and then earning a traditional Bachelor of Arts again without penalty. There is an issue always around a common culture when you take a college and a university and you shove them together because the two do not naturally merge. But by integrating our programs, it was one of several ways in which we demonstrated that there was no qualitative difference among our legacy faculty from college days and the many, many new university faculty whom we have hired over the last half a dozen. By extension, this, 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 this integration, this academic integration, suggests a possibility of an integration of our faculty in a common mission. And so the initial schizophrenia that we had as we took one kind of institution and tried to make it into another kind of institution was in part solved. Not suggesting we're all the way there, but it is, I think, a work significantly in progress. The other thing that we need to keep in mind, there has to be greater differentiation among universities and one must guard at all costs against mandate creep. As much as universities might begin as institutions committed to undergraduate education and to teaching, we all know that over time they inevitably begin to look like every other university. In Canada, every small university wants to be a bigger university. Every regional university wants to be a national university. And every university in Canada wants to be the University of Toronto. This will be a challenge for all new universities. And the new universities have to make clear that they have an undergraduate mandate and that they will not swerve from it. Now, governments have helped us a little bit by entrenching it in legislation but even governments can change their minds. We are a teaching institution. Faculty must accept that they teach more. Teaching performance is the, mo is the most important element in tenure considerations, in promotion. And while we do encourage research, primacy inevitably must be given to research that can involve undergraduate students or that has a direct bearing on teaching. We heard a little bit earlier today about blended learning. It is also part of the new world of these universities. My own university has 19,000 students and we deliver every semester to 7,000 of those students through our own online operation, one or two of the courses that they take. 
What has been demonstrated is that the quality of those courses is every bit as good as the quality of face-to-face -face courses. The two different kinds of learning seem to have meshed in an effective kind of way, but there are other things that are equally important. Flexibility for our students. Fully half of the students at my university work at least 20 hours a week. It allows them greater access and saves institutions money, by the way, because online delivery is significantly less expensive once the startup costs are covered than face-to-face -face courses. The other thing that we learned is we need to have a greater awareness of what students actually want. Again, we have heard some of this in this conference. The attitudes and values of this generation of students are profoundly different than even a decade ago. Money and success for students 10 or 15 years ago were the driving forces. But this has been replaced with a concern about the social good. And clearly, this must be reflected in the new programming of these new universities. And finally, a few final words. What we need to be is to be honest. We need to be honest with our students. One might ask, do we worry about the outcomes, what happens to our students after they graduate? I'm not entirely sure. Even as we maintain career service departments and all of that kind of infrastructure, our interest sometimes, it seems to me, is to get the students in the front door and to keep them regardless because our business plan demands it. Too many students, I suggest, end up at university who really have no business being there. And we dismiss other forms of education as less significant. Is it really the case that a degree in sociology has more currency or more value than a journeyman certificate as an electrician. I know who makes more money. The second thing I think we need to address is the liberal arts. Over time, the BA has become the sort of woeful last gasp of the walking wounded. And we all know what we mean. We go to convocation, graduation, and I talk to a student who graduates in nursing, and I say, what do you graduate in? And she says, oh, I'm graduating in nursing, or I'm graduating in engineering. And then I get to the art student, and I say, what are you graduating in today? And she says, oh, just arts. Just arts. Well, we need to have a think about that, because really, we all have them at convocation, multiple ceremonies, and we know which one is the biggest. Students end up doing BAs in sociology. The biggest department I have is psychology. How many psychology students do we actually need? I have 3,000 undergraduate students in management. How many managers can we possibly want? But we keep allowing them in the door. We give them false hope. We feed their dreams, they leave, and the dream is crushed. And what I'm suggesting is not that my university or Allen's university has all of the answers, but what I am suggesting is that we need to think in a little different way. And right now, we are not doing it. And I would suggest from Notwithstanding all of the great things that I've heard at this conference, I'm not sure that we have got it. The final observation I would make is our universities deal with an entirely different population today than they ever have before. I'm very fond of asking the question, what do these three people have in common? A single mother with two kids an unemployed forestry worker with a family and a mortgage, and a recent immigrant from the Philippines who has a nursing credential but who can, cannot practice in Canada because she doesn't have Canadian certification. Well, I can tell you what those three people have in common. They were all students at Allen's University. That's the new face of higher education. 
Yes, we're always going to have the 18 to 22 or 23 year old, but these people do not have four or five or six years to get an education. Much as I love philosophy, I'm in the English department. I teach Milton for crying out loud. And, you know, in my spare time, I'll even go so far as to fool around with Chaucer. But the point is, we got to look for different models. And so the only reason I talk about my institution is not that we've got all the answers, but that I think we demonstrate that there needs to be a bigger effort in trying to find a different way of doing it. And thus endeth the sermon. Thank you very much.